We're going to talk about a project called Erasma, and uh, this is a project where developers all over the world can get involved, and it gives access to some very powerful uh, new fundamental recognition technologies. Now, the biggest problem that I've been working on since I was uh, doing my PhD is solving one question, which is what is the meaning of meaning? And you might think it's a, it's a very straightforward idea, uh, what's the meaning of meaning, but it's not, because everything that we measure in our lives goes through the perceptive apparatus um, which does the measurement. If you like, we're measuring the world with a ruler which we don't know the length of the ruler. And so, contrary to the myth that we have lived with since the Renaissance, that somehow there are fundamental truths and there is black and white and there is wrong and right, actually everything that we know about the world goes through a perceptive apparatus which we understand very little about. And one of the things that's becoming more clear is that the world is so complex and beautiful and changing and difficult to understand and fathom and always has layers and depths. We can talk about the same poem as being someone walking through a field or have much deeper meanings. Whole English literature departments do that. But the world is so complex that we can't write rules. We can't understand it to the level where we can write rules and try and constrain the world. And that is an idea which um, the technology world loves the idea of being able to write rules and define things. You know, even now, uh, you'll read about the semantic web and people being able to classify everything, take every idea in the world and somehow define it into a pigeonhole. You know, a bit like uh, a sort of Victorian butterfly collector. You could take every idea somehow, put it in a case, put a pin in it, give it a name, and that will all work. Well, the world doesn't work like that because different people see things differently, and it all comes down to the fact that perception is a fundamental output of your experience. And if we um, want to understand that, we have to go back a little bit in time. This is the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Now, he lived in the 1750s, and he set out to try and prove mathematically that God existed. Now, he never managed to achieve that in his lifetime. Um, but what he did do is come up with a piece of mathematics. Many of you will have come across it called Bayes' theorem. Well, over the last 15, 20 years, people have realized that they completely missed what Bayes was really about. And a subject called Bayesian inference has grown up. And what Bayesian inference does is it allows you to take into account your experience in a scientific way. So it's a magical bridge between the ideas that we all have about how the world should be organized, which are very objective, and we measure things, and we have science, and all that sort of stuff, and the reality that we all live with inside our heads, that actually many of the aspects of the world are subjective. And to understand the subjectivity, one only has to look at certain ideas and how we handle them. A very clear example, that's Snoopy the dog. Now, all of us would say, if we were asked what animal is Snoopy, we'd say he's a dog. But he doesn't bear any relationship to the properties of a dog. It's our experience which means that we file him under dog. So the important point there is that we're overriding the real world information and taking our experience. And we live this way. When we come forth from our mother's womb, we do not have sophisticated uh, perceptual abilities. Uh, a newborn child cannot resolve shapes, let alone actually move those into meaning. And what happens is, for our lives, we learn to distill the light and the dark, the colors, the sounds, the silences, and we distill them into meaning. And it's that, and those layers go on for our lives growing. So we get to the point where we can recognize objects, we get to the point where we can understand speech, we then start talking about ideas, we come to venerable institutions like this to learn more and more complex models of the world around us. But those are what they are, they're models of the world around us. And what's happened now in research into trying to get the most powerful uh, technologies for recognizing things is that people are embracing this idea of subjectivity and recognition and the importance of learning. 
You can only reach for the stars if you've grazed your knees. You have to have been out there in the real world. And that's been difficult to do algorithmically and mathematically, but it's also been physically difficult to do. You can't live life as a PC and walk around and learn things. But what's happened is that the technology has moved on to an amazing point now, where with these little devices, the power is going up exponentially. Every six to eight months, the processing power in these is going up. And what that means is that there now are portable devices that can go around. And with the new technologies, you can do things uh, like you can actually start to get them to see and hear and start to understand a little bit more about the world around them. And I think that we are in a perfect storm. The changes that we've seen with the arrival of the internet, I think, are just pre-shocks of what we're going to see when the technologies in terms of processing power, the kind of algorithms that are coming from a true understanding of, of people like Bayes and Shannon, connectivity, and actually the whole way in which we think about uh, our world starts to change. And what I'm going to do today is just show you the very, very early stages of that. So what we've got here is just an iPad 2. We're happening to use that because we can put it on a big screen, but we could uh, equally as well uh, do it off of a phone. And what this iPad is set up to do is to look around it. And so through its camera, uh, it can see stuff. So here I've got just a normal uh, movie poster, nothing special about it. And it's something that the uh, uh, iPad's seen before. And what it does when it sees it is it takes that movie poster, it recognizes it, it understands where it is in three dimensions, and then it inserts a virtual um, uh, object over uh, the device. So what we're able to do now is take um, any virtual object and drop it into the real world. And we're doing it not by using URLs or text or anything like that. All we're doing is using something that's very fundamental to human beings, uh, which is vision. So you've all seen Harry Potter. <laughs> J.K. Rowling saw this one coming, OK? And uh, very simple. Again, all I'm doing is just showing it different things that it's thinking about. Now, there's two parts to this problem. Remember what I was saying about processing power? We only just have enough to do this on an iPad or an iPhone. But what we know is in six months' time, we'll have twice the processing power. And six months after that, we'll have uh, that doubling again. And what that means is we can start to run three-dimensional models. So uh, if you look at this, this comes to life. But as I move it, it understands the object in three dimensions. So you see, uh, we're dealing with the fact that's no longer a rectangle, depending on the angle. And of course, we can start just taking stuff out of the three dimensions altogether. As we get more processing power, the ability to do those things is going to become more and more believable. So we're going to have the ability in the real world just to hold up your phone, recognize this stuff, you like that bottle of wine, and then drop in virtual things. This is a different paradigm. It's not about sitting in your bedroom and typing words into a keyword search engine. You're at a bus stop, you want to know something about something, you just hold up the phone, you do it, it's interactive. So something that was a, a real-world non-interactive object uh, becomes uh, directly uh, interactive uh, straight away. Now, as the processing power goes up, we're going to be able to do more and more. So we have a little bit of processing power left over here, so you show it this image, and uh, the thing kicks off again. Um, so people standing at bus stops can start playing each other just by uh, holding up uh, images. Now, it's not, it's not great graphics, but the point I'm making here is this is like looking at television in the 1940s. It's only going to get better. Oh, well done. <laughs> You've been practicing there, haven't you, Olga? So, you know, I don't know what this is going to change. Um, this platform is now being used by developers all over the world, and every day I get an email with them doing something different. You know, one guy's made all the restaurant menus and, and restaurants light up so you can see the food. Another great one is print. So a big problem with print is you print the news and you do it at 4 o'clock in the morning. Well, imagine that uh, if you want an update on your news, um, you just uh, hold up your device to it and um, it comes to life. So there you go. So no longer have you got the problem that the news is constrained at one point in time. In fact, any printed image you can make come to life. So you've got that problem of that IKEA table. 
you don't know how to put it together, just hold up your phone to the device. You don't type anything, and it comes to life. And you can actually um, deal with it there. Now, the other thing, so far what I've been showing you has been mainly images and videos. But because the processing power is becoming available, what we can do is actually three-dimensional things. So this is an image. Uh, we just hold up the, uh, the device. And then what pops up here isn't an image. That's actually a three-dimensional creature. We can walk around it. We can run around the table. Now, at the moment, on an iPhone 4, we only have processing power to do something of that fidelity and one of them. On the new Androids that are arriving in the next few months, we will be able to have a whole mini zoo running around on that table. So you can see the kind of level of rate of change of the technology that's going on. What other possibilities are there? Well, for example, anything you print, you can make interactive. You want to know about nutritional information on some product, or you want to just buy it, um, you just hold up the thing, it recognizes it, you can get information, you can get it interactive. What's it going to do to the fashion industry? I don't know, but you know, of course, you can do similar things with clothing. So, uh, if you'll forgive me for just holding this one up here. Oh, <laughs> that's all looking pretty good in there, so uh, that's good news. So, everything I've shown you so far have been things where they would just come to life no matter where we were. Of course, what you can do, and this is the crucial bit, I think, is you can drop things into the real world. So we can go anywhere in the world, and uh, with a little bit of luck and a Wi-Fi connection, um, we can uh, arrange to drop some things uh, into position. So perhaps you need to log in again. Um, now, what that means is that everyone's view of the world can be different. I can walk down Oxford Street, and I can subscribe to James Bond, because I'm a James Bond fan, and I get you know, Aston Martins and, and, and uh, Sean Connery and all that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas someone else might walk down Oxford Street and want to see hip-hop music. Someone else might want to walk down Oxford Street and want to see Harry Potter. Or someone else might want to walk down Oxford Street and see the history of the street. Or walk around Rome and see the Colosseum as it was. Well, what we can do is arrange to just drop stuff all over the world. So there we are, Godzilla's attacking Buckingham Palace. Um, <laughs> And the important point there is if we were to take a little trip to London now and we were to walk down the mall and we, uh, our phone would vibrate to tell us that there's something that we're interested in and that's exactly what we see. We see a different view of the world. So if you can imagine the creative possibilities here for changing the way in which we interact with information and we change with what's in the world. And the way that we're going to organise this world, we don't know. Um, this is just a, an example of some of the work that people have done outside uh, building up. So there's a dinosaur channel around London already. Uh, the programmers, of course, have done Star Wars because that's what they do and X-Wing fighters <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is a murder mystery tour where you go around London. There's all sorts of cl clues and you find characters uh, from films and all that sort of stuff. And we organize that by um, allowing people to do channels. Now, the other thing about this technology approach is because it's very easy to set up, it becomes completely social. So people can just publish their own channels with their own view of the world. So although you're both standing in the street, uh, you and your friends can have different views of the world and you just pick out whatever you want. Now, what we're going to do is now try something a little bit racy, which is we're actually going to try and create a virtual object live. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take some poor soul from the audience and wave, wave at us, do something. There you go. So uh, we've got a little bit of video there. There we go. Right, so that's just all we've done there is record a piece of video and uh, we'll just pick an object. Um, so we have this book, which is the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. And uh, all I do is hold it up to the camera, um, probably going a little bit more than that, um, and then take a picture. And it analyzes that. I pick uh, the bit of video that I had just then. And it has to do a bit of processing here because it has to analyze all of these things and understand them. And then if we've spent time, we could position that perfectly so it exactly matched the position of the book in space. And then with a little bit of luck, uh, provided that the Wi-Fi is working, uh, that will actually create that item for us. And whenever we hold up this device, uh, it should, this uh, object, it becomes there. Now, if we'd spent a little bit more time on that, what we could have done is made it perfect. So, for example, what we would have had is perhaps we might have done a bit of video so that the words moved around and then the author 
uh, came out and gave us a little talk on the book or whatever. But you can see the creative possibilities here. When we're not limited to video, we can do three dimensions, we can do interactive, uh, are, are really quite fascinating. What does this all mean? Well, the simple answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> But if you look at what's happening, for the most of human existence, we've had very little information. Then, if you go back a few thousand years, we started with writing. Um, relatively recently, in hundreds of years, reasonable percentages of populations have been able to use text. And now we're very familiar with text. But actually, for most of our existence, the visual paradigm has been the powerful one uh, that we, we've done. We used writing because we could leave ideas, we could transmit ideas. Another interesting change is that people are starting to live in virtual worlds. So if you look at the minutes per day spent by a teenager interacting with uh, non-existent worlds, uh, it's going up very rapidly. And the problem is at the moment we have an either or situation. You're either in the real world or you're in your bedroom playing Grand Theft Auto. Um, there's no connection between the two. Well, the reality is, and I think what we're going to see is a move to a paradigm which is much more about visual information. So we're not typing words. We're holding up a device, or devices seeing things. And then the results, and this is more importantly, being not distributed as sets of text with underlined blue words, but actually coming out in forms which relate to the real world objects that we use. So this idea of virtual objects in place. And then the second part is, Rather than it being two separate things, you're either out in the real world or you're in your bedroom in the virtual world, those are now coming into being one. And I think that what we've got here is, a, is a, an enabling uh, platform. And the ideas and the creativity that could come from this, you know, I think are very, very hard uh, to foresee. And you know, as I say, uh, we have one 16-year-old who has a cult following now on this system where all he does is leave videos of himself around London. Now, you know, I would never have predicted that one. Um, I don't know why people would want to do that. Um, but this is the kind of thing that, that, that's happening. So we have processing power continuing to increase. We have the intelligence of the devices continuing to increase. And we have the connectivity of an infrastructure to really look at doing things in a very different way about how we use and leverage our knowledge of the world. And, uh, you know, if the holodeck ever arrives, it will all be thanks to Mr. Thomas Bayes. Thank you very much.